All right. Well, I think it's time for us to begin. It's 4.30 um, on my All right. phone. So take it away, Jean. All right. So we're trying to do some professional development meetings at least a couple of times a year. The teacher librarian division is sponsoring it, but we want all library workers to attend and chime in and network with us. That would be most helpful to everyone. And we do have a Google folder for the teacher librarian division. You have the tiny URL down below to look for postings um, that we have there. So please um, ask questions, post in the chat. We'll try to back up and answer questions as we go along. Um, let's go to the next slide. So we want to explain a little bit about who's here and what we're doing in the next couple of slides. I'm Jean Kilker, TLD co-chair, but um, my partner here, Judy Marillion, has done the most work with all of this. She's built and done everything. Our computer science teacher had to leave to take care of family, and they were just going to put a sub in every single day. So I said, okay, I'll teach computer science. I have a degree in it. So Judy has just taken the helm here and done everything but we are co-chairs of TLD. You'll also meet here um, Kalita Westrick, who for many, many years has been the Grand Canyon Reader Award co-chair. She'll talk about that program, which I have certainly enjoyed forever. And then of course, the introductions are all of you. And hopefully through this, you'll network you might meet someone who's in your same district or a neighboring district to network with them. And next, this is the agenda for today. Um, Patty Jimenez is from Sunny Slope High School. She also does the professional development for AZLA. She'll be doing a presentation on Sora. Um, you'll see more about that in just a minute. Judy um, here will be doing a presentation for elementary and junior high that you'll find tons of really good information. This is a, a sharing session also. So as you have tips and tricks for any of these, we'd love for you to also share, but also please ask questions, post in the chat, and we want to answer them right now because probably everybody has that same question that you do. We'll be making announcements at the end about the upcoming AZLA conference. There's membership opportunities and awards and the Grand Canyon Reader Awards. And then please follow us on social media. You'll see them both down below. And um, as we do always, we cite whatever we use. So Judy put the citation for the graphic. And now Judy's going to talk about the presentations. Well, welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you're here this afternoon. Um, we are going to start with Patty's presentation. I just wanted to let you know that um, her presentation will be uploaded in the TLD folder in Google after. And this, um, these slides um, will be my presentation and this will also be uploaded. So please just relax, you know, um, get the best information that you can and ask questions and know that these materials will be available to you later on. And with that, I am stopping our share and Patty will begin. All right, <laughs> let's see if my camera will behave itself, I'll leave it on, but if it starts to flicker, I'm getting out of there. 
So hello everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Patty Jimenez and I am the teacher librarian at Sunny Slope High School. And we're here to talk about how to make your virtual library literally awesome. We're going to talk about integrating those two libraries together. So First of all, I just kind of want to let you know a little bit of my background. Uh, I'm in the Glendale Union High School District. Um, yeah, the Glendale Union High School District. There's nine schools, so I'm one of nine schools in that district, uh, plus an online learning academy. And we've had Sora, well, we've had Overdrive since 2014. And you can see in this first slide that uh, we didn't start out just gangbusters. So if you're just getting started, don't panic. Um, it, it's a slow start, but just doing a few things will, you will see some improvement as you go. And you can see that once Sora came online, uh, we saw a huge increase in circulations. That having that interface versus the old overdrive interface, I think made a huge difference with students. Um, so if you're just getting started and you don't have to battle the old overdrive platform, you're already uh, worlds ahead of where we were. I also want to show you just the, the last two years. So obviously uh, 2019, we um, went into remote at spring break. So the last nine weeks of the school year, nine, 10 weeks of the school year, we went into remote and we were just trying to maintain. We weren't trying to do anything new. So circulations did go down, but we still ended the year up 39%. Uh, and then this year we're right at about 14,000 plus, almost 15,000 at this point. Um, even though we've been in remote and hybrid on and off all year, and we've been in a block schedule. So that means only half of our students were in an, a language arts class at any one time. So considering that, you know, only, let's see, we're at 2250, so just a little over a thousand students were required in some respect to have a book at any one time. I feel like we've done really, really well. Uh, and I think that probably by the end of this school year, we will match where we were in 2018 and then be able to continue to grow once we get back into our normal schedule next year. So I just wanted you to kind of see that progression and that it does take time, uh, but I think that some of the things I'm going to show you today will help you make that progression a little bit faster because, of course, we were just stumbling around in the dark for those first couple of years. So I'm going to share with you three main areas where you can affect change in your digital library. I'm going to start with marketing. I'm going to talk about engagement and I'm gonna talk about collection development. And if you'll notice at the bottom of the screen, I'm gonna give you three levels for each one of these categories. Beginner, for those of you who maybe just got Sora. Intermediate, for those of you who are maybe a couple of years into it and looking for a next challenge. And then advanced, for anyone who's been doing it a while but is looking for a fresh take. And hopefully I'll be able to give you something new to try out or uh, give you an idea where you can take something you've already been doing and tweak it and make it even better. So first of all, if you're just getting started in Sora, I want to make sure that you are using the Overdrive Resource Center. It's a great tool. I continue to use it. Uh, I steal ideas from the Resource Center all the time. I take their graphics. I cut and paste them. And so you should definitely take a look at their promoting Sora tab, uh, look at what's trending, use the social media uh, graphics. Those make great little inclusions in your emails to students. So just know that there's a lot of work that's already been done for you and you don't have to start from scratch. Now, another thing I would really encourage you to do if you're just getting started is to take the time to make collections, make a lot of collections. And if you're in a consortium with other schools in your district, spread that work around. Make sure everybody makes one collection a month. Or, you know, in my district, there, there are a couple of us that 
really like to make collections. And so uh, they'll get on, a, I have one librarian, he'll get on a kick and she'll make like five in a day. And then I'll just have those for a while. And the reason I love collections is because every Monday I go in and I put a fresh collection at the very top. So we have a featured collection at the top of our Sora Explore page and it's new every single Monday. So that no matter when students are going into Sora, they're gonna see something that they haven't seen before. And I think that's really important because we wanna catch their eye. You know how it is when they come into your physical library, they kind of wander around, those book displays catch them and that's how you tend to get a book in their hands. It's the same thing in Sora. I would also say that um, having a check out what's new or a new automatic um, collection uh, is a must have. I have one that auto generates. Uh, so every time I add new books, they go into the collection. And that's not the very top, but it's underneath. So you've got your featured collection, you've got your subjects, popular subjects, and then the next collection on my page is check out what's new. And so that's always changing too. And we're always adding new collections, rotating them around. Um, they're a great marketing tool. I see we've got some questions uh, in the chat. I'm gonna wait and answer those toward the end. So do keep throwing them in there. I'm not ignoring you. Uh, I just wanna make sure I, I get our time uh, going well. So if you're a little more intermediate, you wanna drive students to uh, your collections, to Sora. And so one thing that uh, being in remote has really helped with is students are a little bit better about checking their email, right? Because that's how they were communicating with teachers during remote. And so about uh, every two weeks or so, just to kind of depending on how things were going, uh, I would create a, a Google slide with what was new in the library or if there was a theme, like this is a banned book week um, slide that I created. And you'll notice that there are all these different book covers and each one of those book covers is clickable. And so when the student clicks on it, it will take them to that title in Sora so they can check it out if they want to. Everything actually on this slide is clickable. So if they click on the things about Band Book Week, they'll take them to our Band Book Week collection, which was called Censorship is a Dead End. And once I make the Google slide and I make all, you know, link everything to all my pictures, then I save this as a PDF and I send the PDF to my students as an attachment on their email. And that way they can click on it uh, and get to Sora and see what's going on there. So those are really fun. And um, this is another reason I like to use the Resource Center because they do a lot of thematic um, images. And so I'll just really low key uh, do a snip of something they have, or I'll take their image and I'll take snips of covers and then link them. Um, I don't even get fancy with Photoshop. I am bare bones, just slapping images on top of other images and then save everything in a Google slide as a PDF and it works. Uh, works smarter, not harder, right? Um, so I love doing that. And then another way that you can kind of market these titles is to start working with your teachers um, and getting them you know, excited about using title assignments. Um, and if you're just getting started, I'm going to highly recommend that you start with the always available titles. We call them simultaneous use, but for um, you know, the layman, calling them always available works. And now those are your free titles from Project Gutenberg or your titles from Duke Classics. And those have been great. And what was lovely is, you know, uh, The Great Gatsby came through uh, this year, came out into the public domain and that is a perennial favorite of junior ELA teachers and I was able to get my entire junior PLC uh, into the Great Gatsby through Duke Classics which was wonderful and that's exactly what we're trying to do but there is going to be a little bit of a learning curve with your teachers if they've never taught a digital text so that's why I like to start them with the always available the free titles 
because invariably someone's just going to quit in the middle. Uh, but if you can get ELA teachers doing their Shakespeare with these titles, then they'll come back. And then once they feel comfortable they, using digital text, then you can start talking about, okay, do we want to rent a class set? Do we want to do a cost per circ? And I have some teachers now who are moving into that um, arena where they're feeling comfortable enough to, to have district, you know, buy them a set of books or to rent them a set of books. And those are all things that are available. And the other thing is if you want to do something like that, you want to do a simultaneous use of maybe a title that's not listed as such, talk to your rep, your SORA rep, um, and they'll sometimes be able to negotiate things with publishers, which is really wonderful. I have not done that yet. We are not there, but I'm hoping soon. Um, I just want to point out that this idea of getting teachers to assign digital text to their students really keys in to um, you know, college and career readiness. Most textbooks are available now. Most textbooks in college are available in digital. Um, most of the documents you get for work are digital. So we really are preparing them for their next stage of life. And there's some studies that are coming out now about how students read on screens. We're seeing the difference now. And what pushes Sora kind of ahead of just scrolling on their phone is that ability to annotate and read more slowly, um, to interact with the text and have marginalia. Uh, so if you have teachers who say, well, I don't want to use digital text because I, I like them to annotate, they, they don't have an argument anymore. You're like, well, we can do digital annotation, highlighting, note taking. And the nice thing is even after the book is returned, all of those uh, notes still exist in their account. The other aspect of reading on screen, uh, and the, the differences we're seeing is that avail availability to page down. In, in Sora's case, it would be to page over but it's not a constant scroll, right? You have to advance to the next page, you read one page at a time. And so studies are showing that that lends itself to better comprehension uh, in addition to being able to take notes. So Sora's got the tools to make um, digital reading really, really worthwhile. Uh, when you're talking to teachers about uh, title assignments, don't ignore your science and social studies teachers. They like to do book projects too, and there's some great stuff available. Now, if you want to get a little bit more advanced, then I would highly recommend that you start integrating the MARC records for your digital books, audiobooks, and ebooks into your physical catalog. This is a great tool because when students come in, to your library again someday uh, and they look books up you know if you don't have a book uh, in the library or it's checked out then they'll see the ebook alongside the physical book in your catalog and so then you can push them into the digital library oh i'm sorry it's checked out but it looks like i have a copy available digitally or oh that brand new book that just got published yesterday no i don't have that in the library yet but i do have it in Sora, so you can go check it out there. So that is a great tool. In the early days I was doing that, and that was a great way to kind of force kids into Sora. Now it's kind of the opposite. It's sort of funny. They come into the library with Sora up on their phone, and they ask me if I have that book on the shelf. Uh, and I'm like, okay, well, we kind of need to do that a different way. But it's encouraging to me that they're starting to equate the two together. Uh, the other thing that you can do that I think is a little more advanced is to take those Sora graphics and put your stamp, your branding on them. So you'll notice on these examples, we have a um, redirect, a URL redirect, where ebooks.guhsdaz.org takes them to soraapp.com. But in that way, we have branded it as the GUHSD Digital Library. We use that in all of our um, advertising to kind of get that idea that this is our library. It is different.
from the public library. It is different from your on-campus library. Uh, it's value added. And so all of these posters, well, the first two are just graphics from uh, the resource center that then we kind of fiddled with a little bit and put our own information on there, our directions for how to log in, things like that. And then the third poster, the chill out and read, that's from the summer reading program the first year they had it and we just took the graphics and if you're looking at my, the camera right now I'll show you I also just took that graphic and we made vinyl stickers to hand out to students so overdrive is very lovely about whatever however you want to use their graphics uh, feel free to do that they highly encourage it if you don't feel comfortable doing these things on your own then you can give your account manager your request and they'll need about two weeks and they'll make whatever you want. So let's talk about engagement. First of all, um, you need to do a digital library orientation. Um, when we were in the before times, I would do my physical library orientation that first like two weeks of school with my first year students and sometimes my sophomores as well. And then when they were due to come back to the library in three to four weeks, then I would do a digital library orientation. But what I learned was, uh, so last year, that was started out normal, right? And then we had the digital bookmobile here in March, just before spring break. And they did a scavenger hunt with the students who visited the bookmobile. And I know I had done an orientation with those students and they did the scavenger hunt and afterwards they're like, oh, this is so cool. I didn't know you could do any of this. And I was like, really? Because we talked about all of this when I visited your classroom in September. So I stole the scavenger hunt from Overdrive, pure and simple. I took it, uh, I tweaked it a little bit, I made it I added some questions, but I used their scavenger hunt as a base and then added and tweaked it so it fit what I wanted kids to know how to do. And I put it all into a Google form and it became a flipped classroom lesson for this year. So since I couldn't do an on-campus orientation, we were just starting in remote, I shared this with teachers and students did it a day or two before I visited their WebEx classroom. And that way I didn't bombard them with all the little tiny things that they could do in Sora. Instead, they learned a lot of it here. And then I built on that and took them a couple steps further. Uh, I always in my forms add something at the end, which is like, do you have any questions or you know, do you want to know anything else? And so then I was able to address those in my presentation. And that worked out really, really well. So I'm going to be using this um, from now on. And if you're looking at this going, okay, how do I do that? Don't worry, I am gonna share a handout with you at the end. It has links to all of these things. You can copy it and then put your own name on it. It'll be great. So uh, taking it up a notch, think about events that you do, uh, reading events that you do at your school and put in a digital library spin on it. So we do drop everything and read day once per quarter. We have a special schedule and we hand out bookmarks. It's a whole big thing. It's part of our culture since 2008. And so I make sure at least one of my bookmarks every year has something to do with eBooks. And so this was an example of one of the, the bookmarks that I had printed up and it just, again, reminds them that we have a digital library. I always see a bump on deer day in our digital library because invariably there's some students who forgot their books that day. And now instead of their teachers sending them down to the library, you know, while they're supposed to be reading, they can just say, oh, just uh, open up your phone and check out a book from Sora. So that's been really nice too. I love having them in the library, but when they're supposed to be reading, they should be reading. And then a little more advanced would be to take your in-person activities that you do with students. So I do book speed dating as one of my library visits every year. And obviously we couldn't have uh, books full of tables 
uh, with everybody touching them and sitting right next to each other because we were in remote. And even when we were hybrid, we weren't going to do that. So I took my book Speed Dating Digital this year. And instead of books of tables, I used um, just ginormous collections that they could browse. And I used Google Jamboard uh, as a way for them to interact and share. And you can see I put a prompt in the post-it notes and then they would finish that. And students could go back and look and see what their group members wrote about. And then their ticket out the door, which I always like to have for teachers so that they can give them credit for participating that day is just a very simple Google form that asks them what they checked out, what else they saw, and then there's an opportunity for them to ask me a question. And then what's nice is I go through those and invariably there's students who are like, oh, uh, can you recommend a science fiction book? And I'm like, yes. So I got into some really great email conversations with students and just kind of let them know that I was available to them even if we weren't on campus. Uh, another way that you can encourage engagement is to come up with fun ways to um, reward them for reading. And I am a big fan of rewarding reading with more reading. So I will reward virtual library participation with physical library books. Well, not library books, with physical books. So I buy books through First Book, which is great. You can get books for sometimes less than a dollar each. And students would, were encouraged to submit a form for Quarantines Read. This was in the spring. I created a bit.ly, not a bit.ly, a note.ly. So it looked like they were just putting their post-it notes up on a wall with what they were reading. And then I selected 10 kids a week throughout the entire summer. And when we came back to campus, they could come in and they could shop um, my sort of reverse book fair and take two free books home. One for them, one for a friend. So that was really fun. Built a relationship with the students, uh, encouraged them to come into the, the physical library and just made them feel good about reading and participating. Now, if you're just getting started with Sora and you're thinking, oh, this is a lot. I don't know how I'm gonna get going this close to the end of the school year. There are two things that are gonna help you springboard into engaging your students. The first one is audiobook sync. It's been going on for a while now and you may have even uh, advertised this with your students where they can download two free audiobooks every week starting April 29th um, through August something if I'm not mistaken. And what's great is that the the way that you do this now is really really simple. They simply add a library they add the audiobook sync library in their Sora account and then they download them uh, into Sora so everything is seamless it's really easy and again they have to go into Sora to get those free audiobooks and download them and listen to them and so then they're going into your digital library and using it uh, we also have the Sora Sweet Reads which is Overdrive summer reading program that begins May 5th and those are always available titles through August 20th. Uh, this is a poster that I created and I'll be sharing digitally with my students and teachers, but also ha have some posters printed up for around campus now that we have some students here. So really pushing those free, always available books, getting them into Sora and getting them using it. So you don't have to wait until next school year to do this. You can start with the summer. And then finally, we have collection development. Because that's a big thing too, is when you're just getting started, how do you build these collections, collections that you know, students want to read? How, how do you get started? Uh, and we, at first, every librarian in my district was allowed to like have a small budget and everyone just kind of bought whatever they wanted. And then a, a couple of years into it, we were like, you know what, we're not targeting what the students really want. And so now I'm sort of the de facto coordinator of our digital library. And I focus uh, on buying, you know, sort of the new and popular stuff. We still buy, you know, older things. We buy student requests, things like that. But I focus on what's just, just coming out because uh, that's where we want to grab them. 
So if you're just getting started, I would highly recommend uh, checking out the New York Times Young Adult um, hardcover and, and paperback lists. Uh, when a book hits the, the top 10 list for the New York Times, I immediately buy both the audiobook and the ebook of that title uh, because my students have told me that they prefer using the Sora our Sora library rather than Libby because our wait times are so much shorter than the public library. Our holds process is also much more responsive. Um, I monitor those holds um, every time I purchase books to make sure that we're, we have enough copies. And I won't go into it here, but just so you know, I use cost per circ titles to fill some of those holes too. So I'm not buying a bunch of copies of books that I may not need forever, but if I can get it for a couple of dollars per use, uh, then I do that. And that's been working really, really well. The other thing I would say about purchasing is I think in the beginning, the temptation is to buy big bunches of books all at once. And I would say at the very least, purchase every month. So that you're kind of having new things on a more frequent basis. Uh, we are now buying every two weeks. And in addition to buying, you know, building a cart and purchasing it every two weeks, I am also buying more pre-releases. So in that cart, I'm going to have holds. I'm going to have student and teacher requests. And I'm going to have um, metered content that I've decided to repurchase. But I also have probably half new releases, pre-releases. So if I'm buying on April 1st, I'm looking at books that are coming out April 1st through the 15th. So that every Monday, there's new books dropping into our library. And then when I buy on the 15th, I buy books for the next two weeks. So I'm probably, uh, what I'm gonna do this summer is in May, I'm gonna buy books for June and July so that those will just drop in. Uh, and I simply just take my budget and divide it by 12 or by 24 or whatever I wanna do. I do, I do have a large budget. Um, we use, just so you know, we use our Title I funding for um, overdrive for content credit. And because, you know, you saw that big increase in 2018, 2019, we were able to parlay that into getting more money added to our content credit budget. And so now we do have the luxury of buying more often and buying more books. So another really good motivation to kind of go gangbusters on this and try to get your engagement, try to get your circulations up because then you have leverage to ask district for more money. I would say the next level of collection development is, you know, seeking out books. You know, you, you've got all your great ALA lists. You can definitely buy those as they come out. If you um, subscribe to the book list, uh, newsletter, then you get those top 10 lists. Those are great buys. But I also like to follow authors on Instagram, rather not, not so much the other social media. Instagram feels like where it's at right now. And what's great about these younger YA authors is they're all championing each other. And so uh, they will tell you about someone's new book. They will tell you about a book that's coming out in six months. I save those, I create lists. And because of the way Overdrive works, I can put a book that's coming out in October in my cart and let it sit there until it's ready um, to be purchased. So I've got a future cart. I've got a, uh, an April, April A cart, April B cart. I've got a future cart, a holds cart metered content for time, metered content for checkouts. And I'm always fiddling with those. And then when it's time for me to purchase, I put them all together and I hit uh, go. So it takes a little bit of time consistently to piece it together.
but I've got a list of all of the authors that I follow on the handout. And as you start to follow them, then you'll find more. Uh, and so it's just a really good way to kind of be in the know for that. So a couple of final thoughts and then I'll answer some questions. Um, the digital library has been a, an amazing resource. It was an amazing resource before we were forced into remote. And when we went into remote, it was a lifesaver and it has been. Uh, and a lot of those students and teachers were who were a little reticent to use it in the classroom are now embracing it, which I think we're gonna have some good momentum as we go into next school year, especially now that this has also forced my district to really uh, engage with one-to-one -one devices. And so every student will have a Chromebook and it's gonna allow them to read on a Chromebook at home as well as in their classroom. I don't think it's too late to start doing anything. Um, engage, find what works for your kids. Uh, my personal, I don't know if it's a joke, but it feels jokey, but I don't think it is. That when people ask me, you know, how I get people to use Sora, I just say that I just won't shut up about it. Like any opportunity to talk about Sora, to suggest Sora, to say, oh, would, would you want to put that, a, you want to do a title assignment? Let me know. Like I'm always pushing it. I'm relentless. And uh, usually people, you know, I wear them down and they're like, okay, you, you can, cut, I'll bring my kids down and you can do a Sora thing. So just your enthusiasm will, you know, catch on with your teachers. Uh, just know that you're going to have to do things more than once. You're, I've had to show some teachers the annotation tools many, many times and they've, they've got a lot going on. So they forget. So just make sure that you always bring it up as an option, give them tools and they will come to you when they're ready. The other thing that I can't stress enough is to get to know your account manager. Um, if you're here in Arizona, it's Noelle Zikafus and she's great. And in fact, I have not met a single person at Overdrive who just isn't fantastic. Just super nice and really helpful. And I will email them with the most ridiculous requests and they rarely, if ever, say no. Um, so get to know Noelle, get to know Kristen, and don't be afraid to lean on them when you have questions because they're wonderful people and they're there to help us. They do loads of webinars and they're always free. They just had one this week that was about managing your collection development. And I gotta say, I learned a few things that uh, will make my life a lot easier because I've been sort of doing things the long way and now I've got some great shortcuts. So definitely lean on them. All right, so my email is here. You can jot that down. Feel free to email me anytime. I'm going to take a look at the chat and see what collections we have. So Aaron asks, can you share your collections out of district? That is a fascinating question and I don't know the answer to it. Uh, I've never done that. Um, Aaron, I will find out and I will get back to you because that would be really cool, wouldn't it? If we could uh, share collections with one another because yeah if you're brand new and you're sort of dying uh, I would love to just send them to you so I will see I will email Noelle <laughs> tomorrow and ask her uh, one thing to know about Noelle she's terrible about taking vacations she'll answer your emails when she's supposed to be vacationing with her family I scold her all the time so collections share I'll find out Aaron and I'll let you know um, thank you. Yes. E. Nelson. All right. Those are all the questions. Any other questions? If you don't want to write it in the chat, you can unmute and ask me IRL. Yes, this is being recorded. Thank you for asking, Scott. Absolutely. 
Okay, Patty. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. And you got my okay. email. So if you think of something later, feel free to just shoot me an email and I'll answer that question. Or we can, you know, chat in a WebEx or something like that. This is Scott, the one who just typed in. Can you hear me, Patty? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, two things. One, um, is there a way I can access this recording later? For reference? Yes, it will oh, be uploaded to that TLD folder. I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's great. Uh, <laughs> and then my handout also has my slides presentation, plus examples of everything I talked about, plus links to just about everything I talked about. And I also really like your little squirrel girl um, figuring behind your to your right. She's the best. And unbeatable. Unbeatable. Relative power of both squirrel and girl. Gotta love her. All right. So um, are there any people in the room who are focused on elementary students? You can unmute yourself. Carlita, thank you. Me too. Great. Okay. So um, I think that what I'm going to share will be applicable to everyone at all instructional levels, but um, this is um, one way to look at um, virtual libraries. And during uh, school closures, several state associations created portals of resources that some of them are very useful to people from out of those states and some are more useful only for people within the state. Um, on my blog this past week, um, I reviewed five of those uh, virtual library portals and I'm gonna just share briefly about three of them and a little more in depth about two others. So the first one is um, Info Ohio. Info Ohio has been around as long as I have been in librarianship. That's 30 years, 1989, um, they started. And I'm including them in this presentation because they're the only ones um, of these five that included a portal for pre-K um, students. But all of these portals have the same vision and that is to uh, provide equal access to high quality digital resources for students and educators. And uh, in my blog post this week, I also made the point that they're not intended to replace the librarian, um, which I'm going to prove to you in a few minutes. Um, the Massachusetts Virtual Librarian has three big buckets, elementary, middle, and high school. Um, in that portal, there are links to the databases that are available through the Massachusetts library system. You have to be on, on the inside um, and log in. But one of the things I found interesting about looking at these is I could compare um, what students in Massachusetts have access to compared to what um, students in Arizona have access. Um, the New York library system um, jumped out ahead um, with LibGuides, they're really um, more internal uh, resources, but they do have a translation of practice document that came out early in school closures that was really valuable to librarians across the country. And if you haven't had a chance to look at it, I'm recommending that you go see their um, chart that compares in-school practices to remote practices in several big um, buckets. So this is one that I really like and I wanted to spend an extra minute on the Washington Digital Teach Kit. Um, the Washington, Washington State School Librarians, um, who are part of the Washington Library Association, uh, created this uh, portal. It has two big sections, tools and guides. So for example, in the tools section, if you were to look at Flipgrid, um, it gives you the first step that you would need to take in order to get started, next steps or advanced steps. And then they talk about instructional design with Flipgrid, management, differentiation and adaptation, and then hybrid strategies. 
So they really um, are helpful in all of the tools that they share. I think there are about 30 tools on the site. Then in the guide section, they connect the tools with different ways to apply them. And um, they applied the um, Flipgrid to student interaction for student voice, um, feedback and collaboration and communication. How many people in the room have used Flipgrid? I can't see you. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's an invaluable tool. I've used it with graduate students. Um, and I'm going to suggest it as a tool for um, an assignment I'm going to share. So this is the share that I would like to do. And I think I have about five minutes to do it. Um, but Earth Day is coming up next week on April 22nd. And um, this is one of the events that I always um, honored and celebrated in my school when I was a practicing school librarian. And I happen to like this new book, actually, it's a 2019 book, Our House is on Fire, by um, about Greta Thunberg. And I love her little introduction, or actually it's her dedication, you are never too small to make a difference. So I would start an inquiry with students before using the New Jersey portal um, and read the book and discuss it and um, have students share their ideas and feelings. And then we would talk about some kind of pur uh, purpose for searching using the New Jersey portal. And so I was just proposing that at our school, we would celebrate Earth Day in some way and use it as a launch for a community service project. We would then brainstorm some keywords and concepts, and then we would go to uh, the School Library New Jersey portal. So I have linked all of these, and when you get the uh, PowerPoint, you'll be able to go um, to these sections. There are all kinds of other sections, but the elementary and middle are what I played with this week. So in the elementary second section, they recommend in their search, the sweet search. And I was not familiar with sweet search. So I searched Earth Day, one of the keywords that our students would have uh, determined. And I noticed there are ads in this search engine, um, of course, but um, asking students to watch for the ads and then look for the meat. Um, and these were the first three um, hits that they could follow. Um, one from the Environmental Protection Agency, one from the UN, and one from the Nature Conservancy. Then I would have asked them to figure out which of these buckets they should go to for more information. And science and technology was the obvious place. Um, and there is a link to a site called Live Science, and I search for these uh, three um, broad concepts, climate change, solar energy, and renewable energy. And I found um, that again, there were ads and there were sponsored um, notations. So um, we ended up with, um, is it, what is renewable energy? And um, that article will help students in this. In the middle school section, the uh, search area starts out with a crash course on research tips. I found it very valuable. Um, I'd highly recommend that you go and you check it out. And I picked uh, Newslia, which of course you can access outside of this portal, but um, it's included as um, a highly responsible and um, effective tool for middle school students. And I searched for Greta Thunberg, thinking that students might want to read more about her. So um, that was the quick and dirty of what I was going to share with you. From this, I would ask students then to come up with some ideas, of course, for how our school could celebrate Earth Day and how we could um, turn it into a service learning project in our community. What I found in using the tools in the New Jersey um, School Library Portal is that 
many of them require a good deal of thought on the part of the user. And I think this is something that is really important for us to um, stress with our teachers and our librarian colleagues is that the resources don't teach, teachers teach. And um, I found that it would take a lot of guiding and uh, encouragement to help students be successful with the resources that are there. All the resources are wonderful. Um, and as I said, there were some that I wasn't familiar with um, before looking deeply. But I again think that um, sometimes the portals are as overwhelming as just a good old Google search or an advanced Google search. So um, this is something for you to consider as you look at these portals. I hope you will do so. I think there's a lot of valuable information there. And actually, Jean and I had spoken about the possibility of making an Arizona portal. Um, and maybe that's something we'll pursue if anyone is interested in doing that in the future. So do you have any questions? And all of this is available on my blog and will be also available then in the, um, uh, in the uh, slides that will go up. And I'm sorry for talking so fast, but I want to honor your time. Is Jean still in the room? I am here. Those were wonderful presentations. I hope you enjoyed them as much as I did. I hadn't seen them before. We do have Sora in my district. We're just getting started. The um, Earth Day um, celebrations, we use Nuzella. The teachers love it. It comes in different reading levels. Um, so you can adjust it for different students in your class. It's a marvelous product too. So we're going to move into a few announcements in just a second. Sorry, I'm... That's okay. Okay, so we have been sending out a survey to all the members who we have found. The State Library did a wonderful job trying to find everyone we could who works in a school library. We hope that you have that link and if you haven't responded, please do so. We'd really like feedback for any all surveys we send out to you so that we can improve the offerings that we have for professional development and for networking. It was brought to our attention that people wanted to meet on weekdays. So we honored that um, right now by meeting after school on a school day for this professional development. The next one we hope to have, which would probably not be until fall, will be on technology. And as I said, I'm teaching computer basics right now, having a wonderful time. Um, I'll hope to present on easy things that librarians can do to tie in with reading. And then the conference is coming up. So um, please make sure to register for it. But we also really would like proposals from the TLD core of people so that we're presenting to the attendees in our cohort. Um, those are due soon. Please turn them in. There's more information in the link at the bottom. And of course, this slide will be available to you. I'd like to jump in here for a yeah. moment. Um, I am on the subcommittee for programs for the conference. And so far we have very few submissions and only one from a school librarian. So I highly encourage you, if you have something you would love to share, please consider um, sending a proposal. They're due on April 30th. And if you have any questions about your proposal or you want any um, coaching, um, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I would love to help you um, submit a successful proposal. 
Yeah, and I present it many times. I'd be delighted to help you, however. So membership. Um, if you've been on a or tried to go to AZLA um, online, we are changing our ISP and a new vendor for software. So it does say it's currently under construction. We've also been um, discussing with the board for AZLA to change the new rates. And we're working on those to happen to be only $30 a year for TLD, for the those in the teacher librarian um, cohort type and, and others. So these that $30 divides in half what the rate has been just about. And these are the things that you get with your membership. A lot of good networking information, programs like this that we're having today. Um, and you can see that list right there. And again, this all these um, PowerPoints and presentations will be in the um, TLD folder. But we always need leadership. We need people to help. We need people to step up and be on committees. If you're going for national board certification or the teacher leadership, um, if you need evidence for evaluation, all of these things are helped for your application by having a leadership position with TLD. I have national board certification and renewed it. Um, there's tons of help for that. The teacher leadership through the Department of Ed. By having a position, you make a stronger, um, I don't know, emphasis on yourself for these types of certifications. Or just please volunteer because we'd love to have you. Then there's opportunities for regular state awards. We have, there's a long list of state awards, but the one for TLD is Follett School Librarian of the Year. And every year that is awarded um, with a wonderful plaque and um, recognition and monetary funds also. So consider that, it's really good. Carlita is gonna talk about the Grand Canyon Reader Award. Okay, the, the, this is the list of the winners that we just voted. Um, April 1st was the last day for the voting for this year, so it's already done. Um, we did not have a winner for the tween nonfiction or the teen group, but we did for the other ones. We received, um, let me see how many votes. We received 20, only 20,674 votes this year. Um, last year, we only received 15,800, so we're, we're up a little bit from last year, but we were way, way down from previous years because we, usually we get about 45,000 votes, so um, we were down quite a bit. And the awards for the 22 nominees are already posted on the website, and um, the 2023 committees are... Um, working right now to, to make their selections and they will be done by deep about December 1st, we'll have the 2023 list. Anybody have a question? You know, if someone doesn't know about the Grand Canyon Reader Awards and how you can get involved, um, you certainly should reach out to Curlita. Um, she's been chairing this uh, committee for a long time co-chairing and um, ages ago um, it, when I was in a school library we voted every year on these awards so um, it would be wonderful if we could re-infuse the awards with more participation from students and teachers across the state. Yes I agree so if you have any ideas on how to promote it just holler at me. So we do have um, accounts. I think those were at the beginning also. 
please follow us. Um, the, the hashtags and the Twitter accounts there and the Facebook account for the Arizona Library Association. Those are still going, even though the webpage is under construction. Um, announcements are there. The, there will be a link for all of the information from this meeting will be there. So please um, join us, network, ask questions, find good information. And then there's uh, my email, Jean Kilker and Judy Morellian's email, if you have questions for us. And then please remember the uh, URL where the folder is. And we're delighted that so many of you were here. This is wonderful. And we'll grow and grow and grow. Judy, anything from you? Well, I would just like to thank people for coming. And um, we encourage you to invite your colleagues um, from your district. We're trying to grow our membership again. And if you have specific ideas for the kinds of professional development uh, we can offer, please reach out to us directly. And um, we're here to serve you and to work with you. And if anybody wants to do a statewide portal for resources, um, be in touch with us because um, we think it's very exciting what they've done in other states. And I think one of the most exciting things about it is that there was collaboration among the librarians. I failed to say that the Massachusetts um, portal included 24 seven um, question answering and they had a team of librarians who answered questions for parents and teachers and other librarians um, early on in the uh, school closure. So working together, we can be stronger and more effective. Thank you again. Thank you to Patty and to Carlita for sharing. And we look forward to seeing you again. <laughs> yes, thank you, Patty. Thank you, Carlita.